This is episode 45. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears. And once again, you're here on the Business of Architecture show where we talked about, yes, you guessed it, the business side of architecture. Now, we always like to throw a little bit of design in there to, you know, keep our curative curiosity going. But we, what we really try to focus on here is how you can have a great business, or if you're not going to go into business for yourself, how you can have a successful and fulfilling life as an architect and not have money hold you back from achieving your true potential. Today, I'm excited to have Kevin Costello on the program today. In 2009, Kevin arrived in Arizona after graduating out east with a master's degree in architecture. He had a suitcase and a whole lot of dreams. Kevin, is that an adequate description? That's perfect. Yeah, it's great. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your background. Kind of tell us who you are. Help us let, get to know you. How did you get into architecture? And then tell us about that that move when you came out east and what prompted you to move to Arizona during the height of the Great Recession. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess the, the I mean the job market wasn't great anywhere at that point. But um, yeah, a little bit about myself. I grew up in Connecticut, a uh, town on the shoreline of Connecticut, Guilford, and I went to school at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, it's a co-op school, which I thought would be a great school um, because it takes uh, you do at least roughly 24 months of full-time employment while you're in school. Um, so I graduated there with an undergraduate of uh, Bachelor in Science in Architecture and then went on to get my master's degree. Um, between those two, I took a summer trip um, almost around the world. I went uh, to Texas and uh, Denver and um, San Francisco and Japan, and then back to Los Angeles and Las Vegas. And you would think of all of those places that Las Vegas would be the least uh, interesting of them. But I was just fascinating with, uh, with what was going on in, in the desert Southwest. Um, so after that trip, I got really interested in the desert Southwest, and I had a professor who worked in Phoenix for a while, and I started to do some more research, and I just found it to be a fascinating place, um, and a place that I thought, you know, maybe I'll move there and try to make a go at it. So when you moved there, you had, you had, did you have any job co contacts or any prospects? I had a few recommendations from my professor who had worked here, um, so he had a few contacts here, but I had reached out to all of them and none of them had any work. Um, but I decided to just, you know, I wouldn't be able to get a job there while I was back at, in Boston. So I just decided to move out there anyway and, and try, uh, you know, hitting the pavement. All right. So Kevin Costello is the chief designer of The Ranch Mine. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about how he built a design practice from scratch. And this is going to be a great interview for those of you who are wondering how you can achieve your dream of being able to contribute positively by running your own business. So, Kevin, tell us then, you are now in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Describe what that was like, those that first month, say, and tell us a little bit, too, about the background. Did you have some money saved up? What kind of position were you in to give us a good feel for where you're starting from? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I had some money saved up. I, um, I was fortunate enough to get academic scholarships uh, to, uh, for my undergraduate as well as my graduate degree. Uh, so I had very minimal loans. Um, and because I was able to work uh, for 24 months while I was in school full time uh, paid um, during 2006, 7, 8, um, when, when stuff was good, I was able to save up some money and move out. Um, so that first month, I mean, it was, it was crazy. I had never, I had never been to Phoenix before when I, you know, I drove from the East coast to Phoenix and I just arrived and it was, a, it was a different world uh, out here than anything I knew. Um, so nothing can really prepare you for that. I mean, you can look at a map, but it, it really doesn't do the size or the, you know, the scale of Phoenix justice. Um, so the first month I was just trying to get my bearings really, uh, find out where I was, what I was doing 
and and trying to get a job. Um, so I was applying to lots of places. First, I started off with contacts that I had from uh, my previous uh, professor. So first, I reached out to them. And when they had nothing, then I asked them for their contacts. And I reached out to them and and uh, went from there. And I ended up applying for roughly 250 jobs. In time period of how long? Uh, probably four four to six months. Um, so it was just, you know, wake up, go to the computer, you know, get the resume, tailor it to the, the firm I was looking at and, you know, try to hand deliver some stuff, but mostly, you know, looking online. And I even expanded my search. I went down to Tucson and I looked in Tucson as well, thinking, you know, if I have to commute an hour and a half, you know, who knows, but there's, there was no work. So I ended up getting, I think three to four interviews out of those 250 applications and one part-time contract. So I was able to work at a firm uh, part-time for just one job that they had. Okay, Kevin, I want to go back for a second because <laughs> <laughs> four months yeah. applying for 250 jobs. And yes. first of all, I'm just, I think that's a, that's interesting that you, that you know that number, but maybe mm -hmm. that says something about your personality. Now, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, how do you get up day after day, 250 rejections, and how do you get up, you know, mentally and go out there and still be, still want to get out of bed, still want to go take a shower, still want to, you know, get on that computer and get told no again and again? How, how do you do that? Well, part of it for me was, you know, I put myself out here. I moved away from my friends and family um, to go do something for myself. And so that's a sacrifice uh, in its own. Um so it was not only to prove something to myself, but also, you know, to my family and friends. I didn't want to, you know, put my tail between my legs and, and go back home after two months and say, oh, I tried and move back in with the parents. Um, so I really, that was a, a huge motivation for me was to just keep going. And I didn't really think that there was any other, there's any other option. I, you know, I had to get a job. Um, so that's really what inspired me every day to, to just keep doing it. So it was a dogged per determination, mm -hmm. persistence, not wanting to give up, and just not willing to be defeated. Right. Yeah. And I, I tried for a little bit, too, to, I mean, most of those 250, I would say probably 225 to 240 were all architecture-based jobs. I applied to some construction-type jobs, didn't have any experience in that, but thought I'd try that. And I, then I applied uh, in high school as a bank teller. And then I tried to applying to some banks to just get a job to, you know, carry me over. But I don't speak Spanish and all those in Phoenix you need to pretty much speak Spanish as well to be, you know, in the service industry. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of funny. I was, you know, I couldn't even get an interview to be uh, once I tried to be a, a pizza delivery guy. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, with a master's of architecture? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I tried to get a job in the pizza delivery service and I was asked, do you have any experience delivering pizzas? Um, which I did not. So, um, unfortunately, you know, having a, it's kind of tough that I think a lot of the people were deterred by the higher level of education, thinking that I would just leave when I got something better, uh, mm -hmm. which would have been true. Um, so it actually made it more difficult, I think, to get, you know, a service level job as well. So it was, it became very difficult. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. And you know, I, I know, I know it takes a, a lot of willpower to be able to take that kind of rejection and, and to be in that situation, but we all experienced, I mean, I, ha I know I have a buddy who was graduate, you know, he was from an Ivy League school and in his desperation, he tried, he applied for a job at, at Walmart and yep. he could not get a job at Walmart. Yeah, not <laughs> so surprised. We, we just laughed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So you're, you're there, you've done. Um, you know, this is really a good a place to stop for a second and say, Kevin, I'll bet you are an ace interviewer and I bet you know how to craft a mean resume and I know you, you know how to look for a job. So let's take a little brief uh, segment here and let's talk about for students who are in school who are listening to this episode today, what advice can you give them for finding not only a good job, but a job that plays into their long-term goals and how to go about interviewing? Well, I think the key is... It's, it's almost impossible, I think, to get a job in a tight market if you don't know someone in the industry or know a person who knows someone in the industry. 
So my first advice would be to get involved in community-based things where architects and go to to socialize and just meet them on sort of a, a just a very informal basis. I think it's really hard because we get we get resumes now and it's very difficult to get a random resume and you know nothing about the person and you're comparing it against someone else. To me, it just, you know, when you're busy, it just looks like a Word document with everyone has roughly the same resume and the same stats and all that kind of stuff. So it's very hard to differentiate between people. I really appreciate it. I know now when people come up to me and introduce themselves and talk a little bit, you find out more about the person. And when you have a personal connection, I think that immediately puts you at the forefront. Um, and then say, you know, I, oh, I sent my resume, you know, then, then you're in that person's head. So I say that'd be the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is to make sure that it's tailored specific to who you're applying uh, to the firm. There's nothing, in my opinion, worse than getting just a standard, hello, sir or madam, I'd like to work for your firm kind of thing. Make sure that you know something about the firm, because for me, it shows that, you know, they've taken the time to, to look at your work and they're actually interested um, in helping your business. Um, and then that would be the third thing would be saying, this is why I would be valuable to you at your firm. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So let's take it now. You, you, you landed a job. Tell me a little bit about that first job and then bring us up to speed about, you know, kind of your transition from working at that job to running your own firm. Sure. Um, so I landed a, a part-time job and it was, it was really part-time to the point of where I would get a phone call. Hey, can you come in today for four hours? It was almost an on-call uh, type of thing. And it was a residential firm of, again, a connection that I had from my professor back in Boston, someone he went to school with a long time ago. And so they needed a little help here and there. Uh, so I was able to go there and do some work at that time. I was still applying to other jobs. Um, but this was probably, I moved out here in May and this was probably September or so at this point. Wow. Um, that I, that I first started working there and that was about a month, I think total that I worked there. Mm -hmm. Um, so at that time I had met and was, um, was dating, uh, a friend uh, who's now my fiance, and we um, we we met through a mutual friend, and so we started to look at uh, houses um, as a potential for an investment. Um, she was out of school and had some money saved up and wanted to move out of her parents' house, and I had the skills necessary to you know to look at houses and find out what would be valuable and what would be a good deal and that sort of stuff. Um, and it was just one of those things where in Phoenix at that time, you would just be driving down the street and, you know, half of the houses were being foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a huge opportunity there um, with very little money to, to, to create an investment opportunity. Um, so at the time, um, I knew my lease would be up, you know, in, in May, the year, the May after. And I thought, you know, if there's a way that we can purchase a house and, and work on it and put some sweat equity into it that we could, you know, not have to, you know, pay rent or all this kind of stuff. Um, so at that time, while I was working part time, we were also looking at houses as a potential for an investment. Okay. Now, what I'm hearing from this right now is, you know, you're, you're doing this part time job. Um, you met your fiance, mm -hmm. and she had some money saved up. Like, give me an order of magnitude. I mean, how much money are we talking here? I that? think roughly fifty thousand dollars. And then out of your own pocket, was that combined with yours, or um, probably if we combined fifty to sixty thousand? Okay. So it's, one of the challenges I see is that the cash flow. So if you guys are in this process and you manage to acquire this a property, how are you making money to live? And what what did yes. you think about that? Like in your head, you're like, how are we going to make this work? Um. Well. One of the things is if we had done it over again, I probably would have thought about more issues that came up earlier and maybe not have done it. Um, but uh, so, I mean, we just knew that the houses were really inexpensive. We could, we, her father wanted to be, uh, do some real estate investing. He was retired and, and wanted to do some real estate investing in that market. 
um, so that we knew that we could potentially get an investment from him uh, so that we could keep some of the cash and be able to pay him back as a loan, uh, the loan that he would give to us um, to do it. So that was really sort of how we set it up was if we can get a loan for a certain amount of money from him plus the cash, we should be able to do the necessary things. And then the other aspect of it was there was the first time home buyers uh, tax credit at the time, uh, which I believe was $8,000. And uh, we were also looking to get a roommate uh, to pay rent uh, to also subsidize the loan, basically. Excellent. So you mean you minimize your living expenses and you, you had enough investor money that you lived off of some of that money? We lived off our own money. Your own savings, we okay. We investor money to purchase the property. Got it. And pay them back. Yeah. Got it. Makes sense. So mm -hmm. I know some people listening to this are going to be like, ah, oh, you know, another story about someone that had money. I mean, they had the rich father-in-law, you know, and that's that's what contributed to their success. But when I look at it, because I'm doing the interview here, I see mm -hmm. that it doesn't seem that easy. I mean, if I oh, go to my father-in-law and I say, hey, you know, could you spot me 120 grand? I mean, how how difficult was that to you know, get your father-in-law on board and be able to have him make that loan. And tell me about that process a little bit. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's definitely not easy. I mean, we put in a lot of effort and work and stuff into getting it. Um, but it was really, and it's also difficult from my perspective too, because at the time, uh, the fa uh, my future father-in-law, we're not married yet, but in a few months, um, we weren't, we hadn't been dating for that long and he didn't know, you know, is this an investment I can make? So it was really more an investment in his daughter than, than myself. I was just sort of part of the process. Um, and we sort of looked at it as a, a case study type thing of if, if we can, the housing prices were so low um, that there was really a no lose situation to at least break even. Mm -hmm. Um, so because the buy-in was so incredibly low, he didn't see it, I don't believe, as a risky investment. Just sort of a, my daughter's out of college, loan her money, I'm getting paid back on this monthly schedule, so I'm getting my money back with, you know, a date kind of thing. And so it didn't seem like that risky of a, you know, investment. Okay, you know, I've looked at your designs and I can tell that you put some thought into your designs. You bring a high level of design. So here you are, I'm guessing in, in, in Phoenix, if this was a foreclosure, it's probably a typical suburban type home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it's very small. I mean, it's a uh, uh, relative, it's a, it's a 1400 square foot house. Um, just very simple rectangular house. Um, what year is it? What year is it built? The neighborhood is actually a 1950s neighborhood, which is when most of the houses in our area were built. This house actually burned down in early 1980s and was rebuilt. Okay. So all the other houses are block, and ours is actually a two by four uh, construction with trusses. And that's actually the reason that we purchased it was because of the trusses. We knew that we could move stuff around uh, without getting a structural engineer on the interior um, and save some costs there uh, and, and less risk. Um, so, and we wanted to be in an older neighborhood because it's closer to amenities. Because one of the things I did to help finance later on when we need some cash flow, I sold my car and went to just using one car uh, as well. So uh, we wanted to be in a neighborhood where we could walk to coffee shops and that kind of things. Um, so we could have our basic amenities and just and share a car eventually. Okay. So you have this 80 style house. Talk mm -hmm. to me about the process of the design decisions you made in terms of turning this thing into something that would have added value because of the design. Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest thing that we did was um, the, the previous owner, there was a carport that they had enclosed into a garage, a, one, a single car garage. And so the house was one of those houses where you just walk in and all of the rooms are probably 10 by 10, just really small rooms. So what we did was we, um, we moved the master suite and one of the bedrooms into the what was the garage area. We enclosed the garage area and basically there was no true master suite at that point. There's two bathrooms, but they both opened to the hallway. So we made a much larger master suite and connected the bathroom to that to make a true master suite. And we got rid of one of the bedrooms and opened it up to create an open dining, living, kitchen area. 
So a lot of it was sort of shifting the bedrooms down in this rectangular house and then completely opening up the floor plan to make the most of. It was a, it's a decent sized lot, so to be able to open up to the outside and that sort of thing. So a lot of the value added was um, rearranging the floor plan to be a much more modern and open floor plan that's a lot more marketable. Um, and then just it had been... I mean, there was fluorescent orange paint and, you know, uh, lime green. I mean, there's just there's some weird stuff going on in the house. So a lot of it was just peeling it back um, and, and cleaning it up. And what did you learn from the cost of building materials and the kind of finishes that you want? Did you do anything kind of original or, you know, that that you learned during that process about building and yeah, I mean, it was it was a great learning process. I had never done any building before. Uh, I had been on construction sites, but I, I had rarely ever picked up a hammer. Um, so it was a lot of uh, just learning as we go. Uh, we did a floor. I did a floor plan, and we pretty much went after that. And everything after that was sketches and just kind of doing it ourselves. Um, so we used a lot of you know going down to Home Depot and finding what seeing what we could find that was interesting or unique and doing it in different ways. Like in our bathroom, we looked at all the you know the sconces for wall sconces and they're all relatively expensive, you know, two hundred dollars or something. And then we found that the exterior wall sconces for outdoors were like ten to fifty dollars for roughly the same sort of look. And so we used exterior lights on the inside, you know, things like that, where, it's, it, you know, obviously they can take, you know, uh, a bathroom if they can take uh, exterior elements. So small stuff like that. We did uh, Ikea cabinetry, uh, which we assembled all ourselves and sort of uh, Ikea hacked certain things uh, for countertops as well as some other things. So we tried to um, do as much as we can and, and evolve the design around our limitations of, of building. And then we, we brought in professionals for framing and rough plumbing and that sort of stuff. Okay, great. So you, you're, um, September, you're doing this part-time gig. Uh, when did you close on this house? Closed on the house in November. So November, and then kind of give me the timeline from there in terms of your story. So closed on the house in November, started working on it, started demo pretty quickly. Um, and then we started working on it in January. And I moved in in April when my lease was up. Uh, the house wasn't finished yet. There was a few nights where the interior temperature was in the upper 90s and I was living in there, which is not comfortable. Um, so I moved in and then we just sort of finished stuff up while we're living there. And I mean, it's still a work in progress, to be honest. Uh, we haven't done our backyard or anything yet, but um, just kind of piece by piece things together. Um, and uh, so that finished up probably, I'd say we were pretty much mostly done in June or July. And then we had a roommate uh, who was my former roommate in Boston who moved out to go to graduate school at Arizona State, needed a place to live. So he lived with us, so he was going to school. So he moved out in August, and at that point, we had a renter uh, to help with the income. Perfect. So we're basically talking like you got there in May of the previous year, so we're talking about a year. You're into 2010, so mm -hmm. you're up into, like you said, August of 2010. So in August in 2010, at that point, uh, so we were finishing. I would say we finished up more in the summer, and then he moved in in August, and then um, – Claire, my partner's uh, father, was really impressed with what had been done, and he was looking for houses to do more investments and purchased a few houses in Tempe, neighboring neighboring Phoenix, um, to do some some investments. Some were just to um, to rent out, and then there are some that need to work. So we decided to do our next project. You know, the second uh, step of proving ourselves on that second project. So we worked on that from August. Uh, of that year till December. Um, and then in December, I reached out at well, during this as well. I was still applying to some jobs, not as frequently, but I was, all, I was still applying to jobs with no luck. Um, in December, I reached out to uh, the Arizona Republic, which is the, the newspaper here, um, to try to get that new house uh, published. And they told me that uh, they can't publish houses that are that are for sale. <clears throat> 
in their in their uh, cool home section. But they, I I sent a link to our website, which was just a a, a free website that I had created. Um, and she's and the the author said I really like the bathroom that you did in this other house, which was our house. Um, and I'm writing an article on bathrooms. I'd love to use your bathroom in in this in this piece. Um, and so that was really where it started to think of, oh, this, this could be a business. Excellent. So that was the, the end of December of 2010. So we're going into January of 2011 and you, you got an article or you got a, a mention in, in an article. Yes, we got an article in the, in the Arizona Republic. It was actually, uh, there's a little snippet of it on the front page and then it was the big photo on the, the home in real estate section of the Arizona Republic. So, so give me an idea of the Arizona Republic. I mean, I don't get that out here. So what is that? It's the basically the New York Times or Los Angeles Times of Phoenix. Okay. It's okay. the it. the newspaper. Got uh, it. So a uh, lot, lot, of, lot of circulation. Yeah. A lot of yeah, exposure you know, in the local million, area. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the area yep. of greater Phoenix. Um, so that was, a, that was a really big deal. And uh, that was pretty funny. Um, Claire had actually just gone... Uh, to the Grand Canyon for uh, a birthday trip and um, that was when it was published and I just started getting tons of phone calls um, the next day uh, hmm. yeah. to where I didn't even you know didn't know what to do didn't have any contracts didn't have a system for setting up interviews didn't have a calendar didn't have anything just was getting phone numbers and just jotting them down on, on post-its of Oh, we we might want you to do a bathroom for us. Okay, so you're getting phone calls. You're writing things down on a list. Yeah. <laughs> you have a notepad with some some leads on it. Yeah. And then what do you what do you do with those? So those I you know on the phone as much as I could I tried to set up uh, interviews uh, with them on the phone. So they called and they it was you know bathrooms are are pretty simple. In scope, so they would say, you know, I'm looking to do a bathroom, and I said, yeah, I'd love to come check it out, meet you, and um, so I set up. I think I set up that from just that article that week about five interviews, um, and went to those, and you know, just it started from there. Um, and uh, we basically, I think we got three or four of those jobs. Um, and we had to really scramble. Claire came back and we had to really scramble to, you know, create a contract. How much are we going to charge? Uh, what kind of pay payment schedule are we on? We didn't have a bank account uh, for, the, for the business yet. You know, we got to set that up. Um, so it was a very fast process of trying to figure out all that stuff out as well as how are we going to go? You know, we had been doing sort of development based projects. So how do we transfer to a client-based project? Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip ahead a little bit. Let's compare just really quickly that sales process that you didn't have at that time to your mm -hmm. current. Do you have a, a, a systematized sales process now to when someone calls? Do you have these certain steps that you take them through? And if so, yep. what are they and how does that work? Yeah. So um, uh, Claire, who's the chief executive of our company, she the phone calls go to her now. Um, but most of our contacts are actually email based on our website. We have a, a sort of a fill in the blank contact form, uh, in which the client can just type in name, address, uh, type of project, um, uh, rough budget, uh, any, they can upload photos. Um, and so we get a nice, uh, email contact form that has everything laid out and saved now. So that's where most of our clients come. Even when we get a phone call, we often refer them to fill out that sheet rather than, because sometimes when you get a phone call, some people can be very chatty and it could turn into a 30 minute phone call about their backyard. So we try to refer them to this contact form and then call them on our time. And after and how, that, how do they find you know, the, how do they, how are they finding the website? Uh, a bunch of different ways. Um, we've been published in a bunch of stuff. So through that, um, we get a lot of hits from the website house.com. Um, Facebook, um, just mostly internet-based uh, stuff that is how they find it. And have you paid for any place special placement on house or are you just using it organically right now? We're just using it organically right now. Okay. Uh, we love house because I think it's one of the most democratic design sites in which 
homeowners like or you know add things to their idea book which then pushes you up in the rankings or you get reviews and that pushes you up in the rankings as well as opposed to being a pay for uh, mostly pay for site so uh, we love house and we have a pretty good ranking on there so we get we get some a good amount of leads from that excellent okay so you get everything you push them to your email form so at least you get you kind of qualify them and get this and then what's the next step right uh, the next step is setting up an initial visit with them. So once we have all that information, we you know we like to look at where the project is. You know, is it in a certain range? We don't like to do projects that are, you know, potentially too far away that aren't a significant project. Or so we look up the project and see if it's roughly something that we would be interested in. Then we give them a call um, and we set up an initial visit, which is when we both go to the site. Um, we do charge a fifty dollar consultation fee. Uh, that's something that we added in after the first year of business because we found that we were going to a lot of these things where people were asking for tons of advice and then we never hear from them again. Um, and we started to think, you know, is this information being used just with the general contractor? Do we give away too much information? So we found that $50, what we do also, is so we charge $50 for that first visit. And then if the client, uh, chooses to go with us, we credit that back to them. So it could be a free consultation if you end up going with us, uh, but it's just to cover our time and knowledge and that sort of information. Um, so we, we set up that initial visit. We go, it's about 30 minutes. Typically we walk through the site, we meet them, and then we go back and we uh, write a proposal for them. Okay, so you come back, you get the information. Is there any selling that's going on during that process or is it just more of a consultation? It's more of a consultation. Um, it's I guess it's hard to uh, create a line between selling and a consultation. And that's, I was about to say, I mean, you are obviously you are selling. Right. We'd like to get the job. Yeah. Uh, so we are, you know, talking about what we would do with the space. Um, but we also have had jobs where we've dissuaded people from going with us just sure. because we thought that we might not be the right person for this job or they might not even need a designer. They might just need a general contractor. Okay. So then you come back, you write up the proposal. What's the next step after that? Write up a proposal. We email it to them. And, you know, usually we hear back fairly quickly. Uh, and hopefully we sign the contract and, and get started. Uh, if we don't hear back from them, we call them after a few days just to make sure that if they have any questions or anything like that. Once we get the signed contract, start moving on the project. Okay. And do you track your, your close rate of how many people close on proposals and what is it generally? It's one, uh, we just finished up the 2013 stuff. Uh, 2013, we were about 80%. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's you've given us a good nutshell. You've brought us up to the beginning of now you're starting to have your design practice. You've started from, from scratch, literally. You know, mm -hmm. and with a, a healthy dose of, of helping from other people, which I think is yeah. one of the key takeaways. Um, just to end up this episode, Kevin, could you give me sort of maybe one or two or even three key takeaways from those early, that early time that, um, or maybe things that you didn't know, things that you know now that you, if you were sitting down with yourself three years or four years ago, what would you tell yourself? It's a great question. Um, I would say... Definitely try to be proactive in your organization of your of your business, creating those contracts, creating, you know, trying to come up with a, a pricing schedule, um, creating calendars, a professional email, um, some things that are just very simple to do, um, but you don't want to be reactive in that. So I would say that would be number one is just uh, even, you know, project folders, having storage, uh, you know, if you're working from home, which we do, having the correct storage and making sure everything's organized. Um, so I'd say that would be number one. Number two, um, don't be afraid to to put yourself out there. A lot of people think it's, you know, they say, oh, you know, you're very fortunate to have a father-in-law who invested, which we, which we are. Um, but it wasn't like one day he just offered us money. Um, you know, we had to put together a proposal, a plan, um, you know, and put ourselves out there and and assume that risk of, of you know, if things had gone poorly, it could have been very bad for me um, on a personal and professional level. Um, so, you know, 
don't be afraid to put yourself out there if you believe in something. Um, and, uh, and just, uh, sometimes you just got to try things that, um, you don't know, you don't know how to do it. If you feel confident that you can learn things, you know, on the run. Um, and then three, let's see. Um, and, and, and to go along with that second one, also the way that we were able to get published, you know, don't be afraid also to put yourself out there to try to get, uh, to, to try to be marketed because I look at it as sort of a win-win type of situation. They need stuff to write about and you want them to write about you. So to re so reach out to, to people that you think would be interested in what you're doing and try to help them with what they're doing and they'll ultimately help you. Uh, with what you're doing um, and then let's see number three um, hmm I don't know you're talking, um, you're talking to Kevin yeah. three years ago he yeah this young I, idealistic guy what's ahead of you um, I don't know I mean things turned out pretty well um, I wish I had saved up a little bit more money uh before we started things were very lean i lived without health insurance for about four years um you know so we had a very small budget and which is you know again another risk uh <laughs> um on, on a grander scale so i think uh figuring out you know having a little bit more saved up so that you can get through some of those slower periods would be beneficial now obviously that's that's harder said than done uh you know because if you can't get a job how do you save money but um you know those are all things that can be figured out yeah okay great so i have i have sort of three takeaways organize your systems early business systems don't be afraid of the risk put yourself out there mm -hmm. and you know have a good savings have a good runway as much as you can as much as you can yeah yeah okay but don't but don't don't feel like you need so much. Don't be afraid that to let the money hold you back from, from doing what you want as well. Don't be too cautious with it or else there's always going to be an excuse not to do it. Excellent. So basically just go out there and do it, huh? Right. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, Join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, Keep rocking and go conquer the world. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.